She said I was bored. I sobbed over my beer. I know there was an expression to drown your sorrows in wine, but I didn't cry. I saw no reason to cry. I, of course, felt bad, but not in a way that I should be grieving about anything. A guy doesn't need to mourn a woman leaving him. Why cry when you can just replace her? Every day I hear women complain about the lack of good men. It's funny how often I've heard, all good men are either busy or gay. Meanwhile, my guy friends complain about the lack of women who can keep their promises. Many of the guys around me were badly burned by divorces. Something's wrong here. I think people just don't see how good they really are in life. It's wonderful to spend years with your partner and learn every little detail, like every little quirk, about your lover. No, I wasn't complaining that she wanted something else, or even someone else. I was sad that she called me boring. I think she made me bored, only to dump me for it. I don't want to mislead. She hasn't completely abandoned me yet. She just told me she was going to date someone else because I was bored. When I was younger, I loved adventure. My friends and I kayaked along the islands off the coast and along the white streams in the mountains. One day, on a day trip, I circumnavigated an island located 12 miles off Long Island in a boat with a long oar. Before this, all I had heard was that it was too far to be safe. Funny. I did this several times afterwards without any problems. I loved driving there, camping on the state park beach, and paddling back the next day. In Karen's eyes, this was not the behavior of a husband and father. My family depended on me, and I shouldn't take unnecessary risks. Also gone were alpine skiing, my motorcycle, my little triumph spitfire, scuba diving, mountain biking, and rock climbing. So being the good dad that I am, I started riding the carefully groomed slopes, not too steep mind you, put my dirt bike and triumph in storage, traded in my soft ale mountain bike for a road bike, and joined a gym with climbing wall. I drove a minivan, yes, a minivan, with wood grain siding. Yes, I know, but I loved her, so fuck you. After she saddled my rest, the next step was my job requirements. She didn't like my travels. Most trips were for a day or two to negotiate deals. Sometimes I had to travel to London, Hong Kong, and other cities. I was good at short-term deals that either resulted in a solid acquisition or a profitable sale for my company. She hated international trips because they often lasted two weeks. They always came with a nice bonus, so they were really good for our family budget. But she hated it when I left. When I became a partner, overnight travel dropped dramatically. Most of them are domestic flights, where I could fly in, close the deal, and return home on an overnight flight. However, it took me years to cut back on my international travel. It was a catch-22. Travel a lot, make a lot of money, become a senior partner, coach and manage negotiation teams to close deals for you. If someone else travels and brings home the spoils, watch them rise past you through the ranks. No, no one will rise past me for any reason. I played it smart. I was able to combine travel goals so that one trip could lead to multiple successes in my pursuit of a partnership. I was the first in my company to use teleconferencing to do legwork. I tried to charter small planes for my teams so we could make the most of our time on the ground. It cost me a few good chunks of my bonuses, but it was worth it in the long run. I walked up those stairs. Karen was happier and everyone was safe, but damn, I was bored. I gave up everything to fit her priorities and I became bored. What crap, so off she goes, I thought. May she find the excitement she is looking for. In the meantime, I'm going to return to myself, who I loved to be in those distant times. The me who had fun doing my thing. Me who defied gravity by flying down a muddy slope during a motocross weekend, I jumped into a helicopter to find fresh snow on a remote slope outside the city, and was busy all day skiing down it. The same me who returned to the same slope in the summer when I climbed up again, she expected me to stay home and wait for her. Remember that security thing? Well, I was supposed to be on duty to come to her aid if she got into trouble on her date. Seriously? 25 years of marriage after 4 years of friendship and dating in school. And all this time I thought she was smart. Well, it turns out not. I didn't sign up for this. I won't be home either on call or waiting for her to return. Tell it to boring. 
all bets were off. All vows were canceled. Along with forsaking all others, go to hell with love, honor, cherish, and obey. Well, she gave up the latter, and now I know why. Boring wouldn't have mattered if obedience had been observed. So I got home from work, changed into jeans and a sweatshirt while she showered, and dug out my old boots when she got out of the shower. She always loved me in boots. Riding boots, hiking boots, western boots, dress boots, it all made no difference. But they all went out the window when I transformed into the safe me. I'd say I got bored after everything I've now rethought. Although I knew I looked good in these boots, they fit me just as well as ever. Over these 25 years, I gained weight, but it was all in my upper body muscles. So now that I had shoulders and man boobs, these boots looked even better. A little aftershave and a nice sport coat, and there was no doubt that I wasn't expecting her. And there was no doubt that I wasn't expecting her. She was unhappy. What are you doing tonight? Nothing special. In this outfit? Who said that a boar can't have classes? I was out the door before she could respond and set my sights on the weekend. The minivan started up immediately, and its big four-cylinder engine roared to life. Maybe he purred, coming back to life. Okay, who am I kidding? The minivan hissed and began to move. To his credit, he was running down the driveway and into town before Karen had a chance to put anything on. And I grinned when I saw her pop out the front door in her robe. Soon my cell phone rang, and I let it go to voicemail. I have prepared a new message, especially for this occasion. Hello, this is Dale. I can't answer the phone tonight because I'm either driving or bored. If you're looking for a thrill, call my wife Karen at 555-4269. She'll be happy to talk about me. Otherwise, leave a message, and I will call you back as soon as I can. But don't be surprised if it doesn't happen very soon. Maybe on Monday, Xiao. First stop to get rid of this crap van. I was sick of driving a car with fake wood. I needed something rugged but elegant. I'd even settle for something with real wood paneling, like the old Willie's van. It would look really good with a surfboard on top, right? I couldn't find a suitable combination. Maybe something else besides the wooden Willie's. I like to describe the feeling of being freed from that old fucking boring spirit in chains and shackles. Oh, it was incredibly pleasant. I used to shy away from something that seemed both elegant and substantial. Bored, I took out the hidden checkbook from the bank account where we used to save and went home. I had no intention of returning home. I bought every one of them. I bought a durable car and an elegant car. The Mercedes dealer was happy to provide me with a luxury convertible. Trot elegant, may amis. There's nothing more elegant than a guy who drives a Mercedes convertible and knows how to say very elegant, my friends, in French. I know I missed the accent marks, but I don't care. I'm not boring anymore, and ranking them would be stupid. Wait, you know the right word. Boring. The dealer also had a big, big-ass Jeep in his used car catalog, complete with lifts. A big, big-ass Jeep in his used car catalog, complete with lifts fat knobby tires, bright fog lights, and an amazing loud train horn. In addition to a dozen other aftermarket upgrades, I left in a convertible Jeep that was delivered to my house and left in my driveway on Sunday morning, bored in my ass. The me that I was was never boring. The me she created was a terrible fucking bore. It really was now a story driven back into its hole. While I began to look for my first dose of adrenaline, I bought a trailer and drove home. Not to the house I shared with my wife, but to my mother's house. I haven't seen my mom for a couple of months. It was exciting. The three-hour drive was great as it reacquainted me with driving something that has testosterone under the hood. Mom was delighted and prepared my favorite lasagna. She didn't ask why I was here or why Karen didn't come too, but she knew something was wrong. She always knew how to read my thoughts. The next morning, I went to the barn and took out my old Spitfire. I kept it there all these years. My brother rode it so often that I could handle it well. I didn't have as much luck with the dirt bike, but I didn't have to start it to load it into the trailer. By lunchtime, I already had my bike and car on the trailer, and my mother had a smile on her face. So will you tell me about it? I smiled too. What's mom talking about?
For 25 years, you have lived like Karen. You raised three children while burying my son in minivans and on bunny slopes. And suddenly you come to visit without your wife. You drive a monster truck. You want your own sports car and motorcycle, and you wear these beautiful boots. As I said, my mother read me like a book. I explained to her Karen's recent struggle with insanity. Baby, this girl might be crazy, but you should thank her. Honey, she let you go free. Mom was right. Mom was always right. That same evening, I turned the phone back on. Karen and the children called and wrote all day. I put the kids in a text group and responded. I'm fine. I'm at my grandmother's now. Your mom and I don't see eye to eye on something. And I decided I needed to think about it. So I went to visit. Eli said, Dad, Mom is furious. She says you disappeared. And she doesn't know why. I'm not going to lie, I told her. And I'm not going to say why. It's not for me to explain this to you. All I'll say is that your mom thought I was boring, so I'm doing something about it. She can tell you what she did. Dad, this doesn't look like mom at all. She always behaves carefully. She would never jeopardize you or our family. You have to go home and fix everything. Thank you, dear, for your faith in me, I said. Before you crucify me for this little episode, why don't you get the truth out of your mom? Daniel said, Dad, we don't blame anyone. We just want you to know that we love you both and only want the best. Thank you, son. Let me know when you talk to your mother. I spent the night with my mom laughing at a crappy old movie and was about to go to bed when the text rang. Jenny said, sorry, dad. I can't believe my mom was dating another man. I know, honey. What are you going to do? I will live my life as always. I'm just not going to worry about your mom's rules in life because if they really mattered, she would have followed the rules of marriage that we both agreed to. Don't be a child. She set me free. I can live the way I want. Daniel said, Hi, Dad. I got it. Give Grandma a kiss for me, and when I get home next weekend, I want to ride a Spitfire. Yes, you guys understand me as well as your grandmother. You better believe it. Can we count on a ski holiday during spring break? Somewhere by helicopter instead of a ski lift? What can I say? My kids knew what I used to do and what I really loved. They saw pictures of me skiing and muddy riding a motorcycle. I answered, of course. I think about Banff. Get in shape. Country trails are fun, but they are difficult. My ass is boring. On Sunday morning, my mother and I were at our favorite bakery store. I stayed and helped her with some chores around the house. My phone got a text during lunch, and I laughed at the angry message from Karen. They have already delivered my Mercedes. They locked the keys inside since I had spare ones. All she could do was stare at him, and he locked her car in the garage. I'll have to send the delivery team an extra tip for this. I came home. Karen's car was parked there. I backed the Jeep down the driveway and parked it. Karen's car was parked there. I backed the Jeep down the driveway and parked it. I jumped into my new Mercedes and drove off, chuckling again as Karen ran out and tried to stop me. Now she could see my new Jeep with a trailer filled with a couple of her enemies, my Spitfire and my Kawasaki. Food for thought. At least her side of the garage was clear and she could pull out. Maybe she'll leave then. Too easy. My ass is bored. I didn't return home. I stopped at the mall to buy enough clothes to last me a couple of days and then checked into the Hyatt Hotel next to my office. I rented a penthouse room. I have earned all these bonuses over the years for a reason. I slept pretty soundly. The next day, I went to work as usual and told my team that I was going on my next banquet trip to Hong Kong, which included the acquisition of 160 acres of prime industrial property. Negotiations had reached a dead end, and it seemed to me that now was the right time to go flex my boss's muscles. My team was delighted. They'd shortlisted three more possible acquisitions to look flex my boss's muscles. My team was delighted. They'd shortlisted three more possible acquisitions to look at while we're there. What are we waiting for? I asked them when they showed me their preliminary research on these objects. We're going to look, but be prepared to buy. Warn our lawyers that we are going in there with guns in our hands, and they should be prepared to work through some serious paperwork. Gather people together for at least a month.
If you can't do this, then make plans to make notes for Ian's group team. Feel free to fly with your family so they can see you at least once while you're away. I don't want any divorces because of this jerk. In fact, I will pay for the hotel, airfare, and expenses for them at the time you choose. I'll even go sightseeing. I want you to be happy, greedy, and effective. A month, boss. Maybe more. I'm planning to visit Sydney and Buenos Aires for a group of hotels before we return. I'll send Ian to Seoul and Mumbai while we're in Hong Kong. We now have a unique opportunity to earn serious money. Nice to see you again, boss. Carter Douglas, my hair apparent, grinned at me as a hot negotiator. I grinned back and grabbed my favorite numbers geek by the elbow. Kim, a few words, please. I took her to my office and told the secretary not to answer calls, especially from my wife. She nodded and I closed the door behind Kim and me. Here's your big chance, Kim. We will work quickly and accurately. Most of what we buy, we will resell as soon as we get home. And every purchase or sale must happen without a hitch and on time. Some of our acquisitions are junk, but we'll be attractive to sellers who have something we want. So we'll be selling some acquisitions to get something else in. We'll also make a few stops to open up new markets for some of our product lines. There won't be deals that bring us short-term benefits, but we'll bring long-term profits that will open the eyes of other partners, people who will move you from being a junior lawyer to something much more profitable. This is an important point for you, so I want you to be there 24 to 7 and ready to support any argument or claim that I make before I do it. 24 to 7? Does that mean I smiled? Caring? Dating other guys? Does this mean I don't have to worry about the partnership? No. One woman betraying me is one too many. You'll have to fight your way to the top, just like everyone else. You know you want to fuck me. It was true. She was a walking wet dream, slim and flexible with legs that curved just where they were supposed to under that juicy ass. And those plunging necklines were a constant reminder of how creamy and soft her delicious breasts looked. Really? But you work for me, so no, this won't happen. But you'll be right at hand on my business run associated with this trip. You'll pick me up in a limousine on Friday morning, dress as sexy as possible. Even if that's not the case, I want my wife to be worried about me sleeping with you. When you arrive, come and pick me up. When you order the limo, ask Jen to drive and tell her I need her to wear a uniform with short shorts. I want my wife to be damn jealous when I leave. My team was motivated. My wife really wanted to see me. My kids were furious with my wife. Kim was excited not by me but to get a promotion. Well, maybe me too, but I drew a line in the sand. I went to the airport to charter a plane. I thought maybe I'd jump out of it. Don't be stupid. I didn't mean to kill myself. If I was going to go back to being the thrill seeker I was in my youth, I needed to get off my ass and get some adrenaline pumping. It was amazing. I rented cameras for myself and my jump partner to capture the stunt. I posted it on Facebook and enjoyed an amazing night's sleep. The next day, my phone was filled with missed calls and messages from my kids. Karen. The children are simply delighted. Notice has been submitted. The real me is back. My ass is bored. I really didn't want to see Karen. The children are simply delighted. Notice has been submitted. The real me is back. My ass is bored. I really didn't want to see Karen. So I slipped home while she was at work and packed my things. I went to the airport and caught a late flight to Chicago. There was no immediate reason to go there, but I did have some perspective on the future that might be useful. This proved useful for a couple of days and kept me out of Karen's reach until the big trip. I arrived very late on Thursday evening and the house was dark. She finally got home at 2 a.m. and didn't even know I was already there. Luckily, she was alone. I would have to argue with her about not bringing her assholes into my house. But this way, I could avoid seeing her until I was ready. They also took money for me for this. I got up early, my updated luggage was already packed, and stood by the door. I made myself a man's breakfast of steak and eggs, and blasted ZZ Top on the stereo in the kitchen. I was wearing perfectly fitting gabardine casual pants and a stylish new sports shirt, the likes of which Karen had never seen before. 
dressy and comfortable. The clothes were suitable for an 18-hour flight to Asia, and I made them look perfect. Karen came down the stairs, attracted by the smell of my coffee. I make great coffee, and her sucks. Oh my God, Dale, you're home. Honey, why didn't you answer my calls? I was terribly worried. Yes, the children told me that you are worried. No need, I'm fine. I just do what I like. Oh no, Mr. Don't. I have a better explanation. This is an excellent explanation. Last week you told me you would do whatever you wanted, and I couldn't stop you. So I decided that if my dear wife was going to do as she pleased, then I might as well do the same. If this is the new us, I can live with it. I never said that you can do whatever you want. Dadding other men, okay, I get it. But I didn't want that. It follows that if you can make so many choices against my wishes, then I have no reason to consult you about mine. There is a reason for that, of course. You have a family for which you must be responsible. There is no reason for a husband and father to fly a motorcycle or race small sports cars. I thought we had everything settled a long time ago. That's what we did, but we also got older and our situation changed. Karen, I gave up all of this for you and the kids. I drove the minivan while crying out loud. My family and I skied the bunny slopes. Until this week, I hadn't jumped out of a plane in years. You said I'm boring. Damn, it's because I was bored. Now the kids are gone. They have huge college funds to put them through school. And here's a big surprise that neither you nor they know about. They each have a trust fund that matures when they graduate from college. They have enough money to go to grad school and make a down payment on a nice house wherever they live. Let's face it, the kids will be fine no matter what happens to me or with you. So what if the parachute doesn't open and I die doing something? Very cool. I'll die with a smile on my face and they'll be fine. And I, you know that I am also interested in your future. You have a wife, Karen. I really don't want to upset you, but no, I don't think so. What? Now hold on, Dale. This is a very big leap. We have only just begun to investigate this whole matter, and you already think that I... I don't think anything like that. I know. I know I don't mean anything to you anymore. If this were not so, you would never have given me this ultimatum. If this were not so, you would never have given me this ultimatum. You think I'm boring. It's easy to give up. I had some fun. I have given a lot in the name of being a family man, but a family man is apparently not interesting enough to keep his wife from laying her head on someone else's pillow. The doorbell rang just in time to save me from another salvo in this ridiculous conversation. Jen walked in with Kim right behind her. These two brought four of the most beautiful legs you have ever seen. Have I already mentioned how good I look in gabardine? I looked even better with the gabardine tent. Jen greeted me with a hug and a kiss and moved to begin moving my four suitcases into the limo. Kim handed me the dossier and began listing the dates of our negotiations. She blurted out the names of the projects and their locations, which captured Karen's full attention. In Hong Kong, Sydney, Buenos Aires, how long are you going to be away? I think a couple of months. You have plenty of time to continue your research before you get too old, but do me a favor and don't let them in the house. Karen launched a series of whining that would make any public broadcaster proud. She had a reason because of this reason I had to stay, and that we needed to talk about how our relationship was developing and where we were going. I stopped her. Honey, it's not the time. Our relationship is not developing. It has disappeared, and right now I'm busy too. See you in a few weeks. I didn't listen to a word of her gibberish as we walked to the car, but I managed to smile at her words when she noticed my Jeep, my Spitfire, and my convertible parked in front of the garage door. All three garage doors, including the door her car was hiding behind. Of course, what she said was too dirty for me to write, even here. Hong Kong is simply fantastic. Kim was in the room next to me, so she was there 24 to 7, but only in a good business sense, as we both agreed. She was good with numbers, and we were able to close all the expected deals, as well as prepare others for subsequent teams who would come back and close the deals a month later. We also made great progress in Australia and eventually entered into an agreement in principle to acquire the entire hotel group. Again, the closing team was supposed to return in a month.
We scouted for additional acquisitions and headed to Argentina. Again, I was able to negotiate with a motivated seller, and the team was able to put other projects on our corporate radar. All this time I remained chaste and true to my marriage vows, hoping to return home to find Karen desperately trying to reconcile. Yeah, bullshit. Karen may have gone a little crazy, but I still love the crazy slut. I really wasn't ready to leave her. Therefore, I took her ultimatum as an announcement of an open marriage. There we remain married, but have sex with whoever we want. No problem. Carrie Moore was an old college friend of mine who became a professional buyer for wealthy tourists in Hong Kong. She spent the day taking my team around the city, shopping at the famous markets. She sent me to a good tailor before our 12 days in the city were over. I went to Sydney with some new bespoke suits, and we spent nights having sex until we passed out. It was exactly what I needed. A woman I trusted, a luxury hotel room in an exotic city, and unbridled lust. I felt guilty for about 10 minutes, which is how long it took me to remember that Karen had written the rule book that I was now using. My ass is bored. I realized that I was never bored. However, I was bored. Carrie wasn't boring. And by the way, her body trembled and trembled when she reached the finish line. I realized that she was not bored with me. When we broke up camp in Hong Kong and moved to Sydney, we hired a guide named Sydney. I enjoyed the pure delight of touring the beautiful city by day and the slender brown-haired beauty by night. I won't be redundant when I say that I enjoyed being in Sydney in Sydney. Rio was equally targeted as a business-rich environment. Our forays into Asia or Australia weren't as great, but we managed to justify another month abroad. And speaking of overseas, I have a hot Latina divorcee who taught me a thing or two about tango, both vertically and horizontally in bed. When we completed our trades, I sent my team back one by one on commercial flights, first class. A couple of days later, I rented a plane where the flight attendants introduced me to the Mile High Club, and at the same time introduced me to threesome etiquette. I had a great trip, but I'd not done yet. Boring? Yes. Well, you get the picture. Before heading home, I took my Rio tan body skiing to Canada. I met my kids in Banff before Christmas. Why not? They had finished their final exams a week before their mother expected them home for the holidays, so the skiing there was amazing, including steep descents on snow slopes accessible only by helicopter. I spent my nights having fun with the kids during the day and having sex until I dropped in with a voluptuous blonde housewife I met on my first night at a bar. When she told me her sad story about how her husband traded her for a young model and she didn't know where to go, I hired her. I gave her a generous housing allowance and offered to pay for her move to become my new personal assistant. Of course, it wasn't until our third night sleeping together. Every night she screamed her climactic bliss in different languages. And when she switched to Russian from her sixth language in three nights, I decided that her translation skills would be a valuable asset to our growing international interests. Of course, hiring her meant no longer sleeping together. My business ethic was not thrown out when my slut wife destroyed our marriage ethic. Besides, the week in Banff is almost over. We flew home a couple of days before Christmas. The children went home to see their mother. I stayed in a hotel near work. I didn't plan on dealing with Karen and jet lag at the same time. I was able to buy a condominium as a Christmas gift to myself and went to spend Christmas with my wife and kids. My cars were still parked there in front of the garage. There was a little Cooper convertible parked in front of my Spitfire. I was sure Karen was going to get angry, but that was not the case. She greeted me as if nothing had happened. Maybe I wasn't boring to her anymore. I celebrated Christmas. I enjoyed her cooking. I helped wash the dishes and took the obligatory trash to the garage. I drove the Mercedes and Spitfire into their compartments. Then I left in my Jeep. The phone rang. I was hoping we would both enjoy the Christmas truce. The way it is. You could stay a couple of days for the sake of the children. I did it. I slept in the guest room. The day after Christmas, I took the cars one by one to wash them. Leaving them out in the elements for four months may not have been the best thing for the cars, even if it was a daily reminder to Karen that things had changed.
I parked the Spitfire in the garage, intending to park both the Jeep and the Mercedes in the garage. On the second day after Christmas, Karen resumed hostilities. Her boyfriend came over for lunch. She smiled smugly. I went upstairs, grabbed my bag, and went back to full-scale war. The children were furious with Karen, and she was not prepared for their fury. I think she saw that things were going wrong. Maybe so, if it weren't for Christmas. I stopped the kids to say goodbye, and they did. Instead, they said goodbye to Karen. We threw their bags into the Jeep and drove to the center. There was a lot going on in the city for New Year's, and we were going to have some fun. We visited museums during the day and clubs at night. Both kids had friends nearby, so all three had the option of sticking together or running away. I also got to spend some time alone that I didn't spend alone. By the time I returned to work, I had heard enough music, visited enough museums, eaten enough good food, and drunk enough good wine and whiskey to last me a lifetime. I fell into a routine that was not a routine. My attack on the Southern Hemisphere that fall gave me new status in the company, but also attracted the attention of our competitors. I was actively hunted by other companies who were impressed by our sudden muscle warming. I did not hide this from my team, who were impressed by our sudden muscle warming. I did not hide this from my team, moreover. I told them that if I left, I would take them with me. Of course, word that something was brewing reached the senior partners as well. I was called into the boss's office. Karen's grandfather founded the company, and her father expanded the business into a diversified giant that included various manufacturing concerns. I was hired when I married Karen and started working as a low-level analyst, which was a perfect fit for my background. They didn't give me anything special and even signed a prenuptial agreement to prevent me from ever laying claim to Karen's possible inheritance from the company that was still almost entirely owned by her father. I got along very well with Mr. Adams, but we were not particularly friendly. He chose to remain personally distant from his employees, even his brother-in-law. I found this strange at first, but as I rose through the ranks, I realized how this allowed him to avoid favoritism and took the same stance. So I refused to sleep with Kim or even play golf with my colleagues. Business is business. So I wasn't surprised when Adams got straight to the point. Business is business. It seems like a lot has changed for you in the last few months. You did a good job, but you seem to have lost a couple of battles with my daughter. Should I worry about you? I leaned back on the padded back of the small chair in front of his desk. I knew the psychology of a short chair in front of a table and a tall chair behind it. Elevating yourself above your opponent is a dominant position. I guess they've never seen those movies where the defeated swordsman thrusts the sword upward into the exposed soft underbelly of the dominant warrior as he completes the final killing blow. I've brought in more business in the last five years than any other manager, and my Asian blitz this past year has been unprecedented. My earned bonus was correspondingly higher than that of any other employee, including your division presidents. And yet here I am, a junior partner. So I'm thinking of taking the standard severance package and moving on. Dale, I can't promote you like anyone else. You're my son-in-law, whatever that looks like. I understand. Business is business, but this cuts both ways. Business is business for me means accepting an offer that reflects my abilities. Tomorrow, I can become a full partner of Woodford Unlimited or Mark Manufacturing. I would expect some loyalty from my son-in-law. Clever. Business is business when you hold me back, but when it benefits you, suddenly loyalty becomes important. While we're on the subject of family fidelity, could you share what you did to teach this lesson to your daughter? Because this is where you failed. Dale, I'm so sorry. And one more thing. Why are you Mr. Adams and I'm Dale? Business is business. I deserve the same respect as you. Very good, Mr. Carter. This, Dr. Carter, remember last, May I defended my PhD thesis in economics. Very good. Let it be, Dr. Carter. I am aware of my daughter's actions and I don't like it. We've already talked, to put it mildly. Yes. Well, she's not talking to me at the moment. My philosophy, it sucks. I interrupted him to finish the thought for him. Your philosophy of loyalty is completely inconsistent with the rest of the world. Your business is a business. 
It's just an easy way to deal with a workforce that views you as a cold-blooded boss with the personality of a dead fish. Tell me, is it wise to keep your main employee down just because he is your son-in-law? I see no particular reason not to transfer my skills to another company. Long story short, this arrogant son of a bitch told me to go ahead and do the best I could. That's exactly what I did. By the end of the day, everyone on my team, as well as Ian and his team, had resigned. You've never seen anyone pedal backwards so fast in your life, seeing your partnership for me with a significant raise, promotion for both of our teams and creation of an M and a division just for us. Once my professional and financial future was secured, I turned to my personal life. I rode my bike on wild trails and dirt roads. I even took part in motocross. I was riding down the hill on my mountain bike and got damn dirty. I was good looking, dirty and tired and playing with a couple of biker chicks who thought it was hot. One of them was a girl with a Harley who liked my motocross style and thought I was pretty good at jumping for an old guy. Then she asked me to call her when I had something bigger than my dirt bike between my legs. I told her that what was between my legs would need more than two wheels. As I loaded my bike onto the platform behind my Jeep Beast, she parked the Harley next to my Kawasaki, and we spent the night discussing the merits of the agility or power of our missiles between the legs. I haven't only skied in Banff, I skied at Tuckerman's, and when the summer heat closed this venerable slope on Mount Washington. I found some excellent adrenaline-pumping runs in the glaciers of the Pyrenees. It's funny to see half-naked women basking in the sun in a high mountain house, right next to a snow-covered slope. It's even more fun to watch them take off the rest of their clothes in your hotel room later. I have completed enough tandem jumps from excellent aircraft to qualify for a solo jump, so I did. The same instructor gave me enough hours on the glider to enable me to jump solo, so I did. I posted everything on Facebook, and my page was filled with comments from our friends and family, especially the kids who didn't talk to their mom any more than I did. But I didn't talk. She tried to drive me into a corner, but you can't hit a moving target like you can hit a boring one standing. I'm bored, right? Kiss my boring ass. After each message, my phone rang. I didn't block her number. I just didn't answer. She tried to catch me at work even used her father to ask for my presence so we could talk. He didn't try it again, after I threatened to move in with Woodford if he tried it again. He had to hold her back to give me the opportunity to leave without her pestering me, just like children. Give me the opportunity to leave without her pestering me, just like children. Then the real yard pressure began. Aunties, uncles, cousins, brothers, sisters, Pets and grocers all seem to be in favor of giving her another chance. You see, everyone makes mistakes, so I offered them my version. I told the women to take off their clothes and lie down right where they were and get ready for me to rock their world. After all, if mistakes like these are so easy to make, so easy to think through, and so easy to forgive, I might as well make a few of my own. And I might as well start with someone who understands the process so well. I told men to bring their wives, girlfriends, mothers, or adult daughters to me for the same reason. They were a little shocked, but they understood my point. I'm sure some will never speak to me again. It's not so bad. However, I was getting sick of the store for 10 advice, and it was throwing me off. And I left. I led my team back on the road. They were delighted as they had felt the blood in our first wave of purchases in Asia and Argentina. This time, we went to Brazil and Argentina. Then we returned to Hong Kong. We did it so successfully that we rented premises and opened the company's first international office in Asia. To your dad, Karen didn't mind since we made enough money there to need a full-time presence. So guess who was named VP of Southern Hemisphere Operations? Yours sincerely. I sent Ian to Argentina and Kim to Australia, and our branch business took off. I never returned home. Karen wanted to follow me, but the children brought her to her senses. I didn't want her, and somehow she accepted it. I sent the Spitfire back to my mother along with the bike. I gave my son a Jeep and my daughter a Mercedes. I gave Karen a divorce and Carrie an engagement ring. Yes, I wasn't going to spend the best times of my life alone. I wanted a good woman next to me. In addition, she loves to skydive.
So I got everything. Adrenaline, a happy home, a new start, my integrity, and a shit ton of money. Because damn, it's gonna have to be made in my new part of the world. If Karen had just come up to me and said, I'm bored, let's find something new and exciting in our lives, I'd be delighted. I was bored too. We could ski together. I would rush to teach her and take her with me. We could travel. We could safely raft rivers or race through Cambodia with little risk and great speed. I would do anything for her until she left me for someone else. I couldn't stomach it. I heard that she is very unhappy with her dates. She finds that she doesn't have enough available guys. She's jealous of the fact that her dad adores the hell out of me for moving away from her because we make his company obscene amounts of money. She regrets what she did, but knows she can't go back. Carrie finds this to be true every time she boards a helicopter wearing ski boots or straps on her parachute. But my last adrenaline rush is getting into bed with her every night. There is nothing that Carrie won't do in bed, and there is nothing that she doesn't like that I do to her. I know because once we do it, she'll want it again. This never happened to Karen, even when we were young and everything was fine. But we haven't spoken since the day her father had to hold her back so I could leave without being attacked. I'm sure she'd like to talk, but she knows how little I want to do with her. Someday, I think one of the children will get married or have a grandchild that I will be very happy to meet. Karen will probably be there, and I will finally have to communicate but I'm not worried. When that time comes, my Carrie will be there, next to me. No, she won't have to protect me. She'll be there to make sure I'm not too bored or bored. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.